Tell us about your decision to become a solo practitioner and your recommendations and tips for success for others considering becoming a solo practitioner. Um, so I knew from the time I left law school that I wanted to work for myself. It just suited my personality. Um, I loved the idea of being able to take my own clients and turn down people I didn't want to take on as clients. I knew that was going to be something that would be more difficult to do if you were in a law firm where uh, clients are handed to you. Um, also, it really suited my personality in terms of, and, and my values, in terms of saying I want to do a significant part of my practice as pro bono. Uh, certainly more than what a lot of law firms would be willing to take on. Um, and, you know, my personality, I love people. Uh, I love meeting new people. So it really suited my personality well. And when I started back in 1989, I've been in practice a little over 24 years, um, I was busy from day one. Uh, I instinctively knew that the more people I knew, the more people I went out there and met, the more business I had, the more clients I had. And so uh, it was within just a few months that I was very, very busy. And so in terms of advice to uh, young attorneys just starting out or people considering uh, starting solo practice, um, really look at what is your circle of influence. Who are the people that you meet with on weekends? Um, for me, uh, I start my uh, morning when I leave the house stopping by my coffee lady, Margie and Margie knows what I do for a living. She checks with me about my cases, and guess what, she's become a referral source. Um, so from there, um, I get into the office and uh, work, but I can also have lunches with folks and really target certain uh, people in our community, not necessarily attorneys, although that's a good referral source, uh, but really target communities that I would like to get referrals from. So for example, reaching out to leaders in the African American community and uh, having lunch or going to events uh, where those leaders will be. And um, also reaching out to the Arab and Muslim community. I'm fluent in Arabic and so that really comes in handy. And always, always focusing on what can I do for you? Never what can this case do for me or where can I get to from uh, you know, significant injury case, what kind of finances uh, is that going to be for my office? Never from that perspective. Always from the perspective of what can I do to help this family? What can I do to help this injured person? Uh, what is the maximum fair recovery that I can get, whether it's through uh, settlement or through trial? Uh, so always thinking about your clients and their families. So in, in terms of your practice, tell us about the size of your office, how many employees do you have, and talk a little bit more about the type of cases that you handle. Sure. Um, currently my practice is uh, focused on uh, catastrophic injury cases, and that does not mean that we don't handle cases that are not catastrophic. I do plenty of pro bono um, spine injury cases, soft tissue injury cases. Um, we generally will take those on pro bono. Uh, it's my practice right now uh, to have about 20 to 25 percent of our practice be pro bono work. Um, I have currently two employees full-time, one part-time, so three staff members. Um, up until about uh, a month ago, I had three full-time and one part-time uh, staff member. Uh, the purpose of having that additional employee was to get ready for a really large case that was going to be in trial for uh, about five to six weeks. And it made sense to hire a uh, temp employee who would totally focus on being my right-hand person, uh, getting ready for trial and at trial. That case got set over. Um, through At the beginning, I started out uh, really, really humble beginnings. I mean, I grew up very, very poor. Um, and when I started my practice, I didn't want to go out there and get a line of credit. I didn't want to have a lot of debt. And so my father, uh, gave me the only $5,000 he had in his bank account and I opened up my own practice back in 1989 and it didn't take much in terms of g getting going. Um, I had a computer, a desk, uh, I shared office space with other lawyers. Uh, so the I think the cost of it was something like uh, $300 a month 
uh, to have the office set up and ready to go. Now, granted, things have changed, but I think that uh, lawyers can find opportunities that are similar to that. And um, when I started taking more significant cases, I didn't do that until I could build a war chest. And the significant cases that I took before building a war chest, uh, I knew to associate lawyers who are able to handle those significant injury cases or wrongful death cases. Um, early in my practice, I associated Chuck Paulson on a medical uh, negligence wrongful death case. And he was able to fund that case while I learned from him. So it really worked out well for me. So um, were you, were you co-counsel or when, when you say associate, with, what do you mean by that? Yeah, Marianne, that's exactly right. Uh, I reached out to Chuck Paulson and t told him about the case I was looking at taking, and he sat down with me and taught me to uh, evaluate, uh, properly evaluate taking a medical negligence claim, and uh, by associating with him, I became co-counsel, and uh, I learned from the ground up how to do it properly. That's a clever strategy. Now, before that, when you started off, did you have any mentors, or how did you learn sort of the basic uh, skills of the trades uh, starting off initially yeah. after law school? Yeah. So I reached out to people like Chuck Paulson, um, who became my mentors. Linda Rudnick is one of them. Uh, she's been a, a trial lawyer for decades, and um, these are folks that I uh, really intentionally reached out to to say, I'm a young lawyer, I've been at it X years, um, I would love to have lunch with you or a cup of coffee with you, can you, um, or to discuss my practice, um, to discuss a certain case, and I'll tell you what, I don't recall one person ever turning me down. And it takes a little bit of chutzpah to call one of the heavy hitters in town and say, I'd like to have a cup of coffee with you, you don't know me from Jane, but... Um, this is, uh, I want to talk to you about my practice, or I want to talk to you about a case. Uh, I don't recall anybody ever turning me down. And so really early on, uh, I built a network of mentors. And um, I thought it was really important not to have one mentor that I bugged. <laughs> mm -hmm. I really wanted to be able to reach out to various uh, individuals. And it's worked out really well for me. And in turn, what's happened in the last uh, uh, several years is that I've become a mentor to younger attorneys. And I am really uh, try very hard to make sure that when I get that call, that I say yes, and that I make it easy, and that I take them to lunch and um, give them as much guidance and help as, as I can. And now that you're the president of, of OLA, you should probably mention that. Are you finding a lot of people reaching out to you now in your new capacity? Um, absolutely. So being president of the Oregon Trial Lawyers Association is for me the height of my career. You know, some lawyers want to be judges. Uh, some lawyers want to be the managing partner of a law firm. For me, for many, many years, I just wanted to be the president of the Oregon Trial Lawyers Association because for me it's all about giving uh, back to OTLA and it's also about being a representative of an organization that really focuses on something that's near and dear to my heart, which is access to justice and protecting Oregon consumers. And I understand you're the first woman of color to be the president of OPA. Okay, we're supposed to be quiet about that. <laughs> <laughs> but congratulations. Thank you. That's phenomenal. That's so in terms of the opportunities out there for solo practitioners, what do you think are the main opportunities? Right now mm -hmm. we're at a point in our legal economy where a lot of lawyers are going to have to open their own practices. What sort of opportunities are there and how can they take advantage of them? I think there are plenty of opportunities out there. I'll tell you, I think a lawyer who is a go-getter has that kind of personality. Can uh, th This economy, this bad economy, is a blessing. Because what they can do is um, you know, hang out your own shingle instead of taking the what for me is the easier way out, which is to be a part of a law firm, small, medium, or large, uh, where you have um, the benefit of somebody else bringing in cases. Really, this is an opportunity that they should seize. Uh, they're, uh, as long as they surround themselves with uh, people who make sure that uh, they have the right advice so that these young lawyers don't malpractice on cases. 
um, that um, they uh, get out there and they don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to take a bunch of people out to lunch to get cases and start your own practice. You, volunteer work alone will do it. Um, Sir, so if there's one piece of advice I want to give young lawyers, it's that the more you give back, the more you get back. And so that's the advice. I was it go for it, do it. Be really, really careful to know the area you're practicing. Uh, to not take on cases that you cannot handle. I think it's an ethics violation for a lawyer who doesn't have the funds to um, uh, fund a significant um, injury case or uh, a medical negligence case. I think it's an ethics violation to take on such a case and then not be able to hire the experts, not be able to pay for all the depositions. Uh, you're really not doing your client a favor. Um, so. But also, there are other cases that they can take on. I just view this as uh, these difficult times that we're having, economic times that are uh, very, very difficult for folks, as a time in which uh, young lawyers can uh, have their own business, their own practice, and do well. So a lot of new lawyers coming out now have a lot of debt, and they're worried about starting a practice and not being able to pay their bills, let alone Pay, uh, pay their debt. What recommendations do you have for a business model that someone starting a solo practice could use that, could, that, that would be financially viable? And, and what sort of business model do you use to collect attorney's fees? So I'll, um, it's a very difficult question you ask because of course um, for somebody who has a lot of student debt you really want a uh, practice where you're getting um, good amount of money each month to pay off those debts and working for a law firm makes a lot of sense in that regard but when those jobs aren't there you really have to be creative so in terms of my own business model it really suits me well I handle cases on a contingent fee and so I never have to ask my client for funds uh, for anything I cover all costs in the case and if I had to bill my clients for cases I swear I'd starve uh, because it's not in me to send bills and if uh, somebody calls and they have a hard luck story I believe every single one of them and uh, I just couldn't keep my practice going so it has worked for me to handle cases on a contingent fee uh, and to have insurance companies making the uh, payments to me and to my clients uh, for young attorneys and I've had these conversations with young lawyers or lawyers who are newly out of law school um, to say you need to be able to bring money in the door and the way you're going to bring money in the door is to convince potential clients that you are competent, that you are confident, that you will give their case the attention that it needs. Uh, you're, not, you're going to return calls, you're going to respond to their concerns and at the same time that's going to, you're going to charge them money for that. Uh, I have seen several attorneys who uh, have taken on cases and the client hasn't been able to pay and what did they do? They let it go on month after month after month and then the client walks away. They got the benefit of the legal services and the lawyer received nothing in return. So you really have to know what cases to take uh, to make sure that the potential client understands that you expect payment and that if the client doesn't pay that you don't uh, pursue that claim. Um, I just have seen it so many times and it's really a, an area, it took me a really long time to say no to cases um, and it's really uh, an art and a, um, if you, uh, red flags go up for you about a certain client, they'll take that case. Um, if you don't like the client, I'm, some lawyers might disagree with me, I have to like my clients to really give them my all and if I dislike you um, it's going to impact how I'm going to handle your case. And so I have had cases where I started um, uh, on good footing uh, with a client and then really didn't feel like this is an individual that I want to work weekends and evenings uh, on a case for. And I've sent out that letter that says um, uh, I will no longer represent you. Here are the names of three lawyers or here's the number for the Oregon State Bar uh, referral service. Uh, please go elsewhere. Now I'm in a position to do that where I can turn those cases away and they may be cases that are lucrative uh, but I feel like uh, if I don't like the client a jury is not going to like that client and so I don't want to be in front of a jury a year down the road uh, with a problem client. 
So for young lawyers, it really you need to work on uh, knowing uh, what cases to take, which clients to take on. The client who's gone through three or four other lawyers is not somebody you want to help. Okay, that you need to be able to say no, thank you, even if they're there with their checkbook. And then you also need to know how to um, terminate a an attorney-client relationship and do it properly. Um, make that decision down the road uh, that this is not a client you want to keep. Sounds like good advice. So describe your experience working with underserved communities and the cultural differences you you have encountered. Coming out of a uh, different culture, a different background, um, I um, it was natural for me to have clientele that comes out of minority populations. Uh, even though I don't speak Spanish, um, I wish I did, uh, there is a uh, connectivity there between me and the Hispanic client. Uh, I have a uh, Spanish-speaking uh, legal assistant uh, who will come in and the relationship is just very, very um, different. It's close. It's We understand we come from minority cultures. Um, so the, the um, communities that I have served uh, throughout my 24 years of practice um, th that are really focused on were the African American community, the Hispanic community, the Arab and Muslim community. Uh, for a while there, the Russian community, uh, the LGBT community. And I'll tell you, once you build those relationships, those cases uh, start flooding in. At this point, um, I don't advertise, I don't, uh, I think I hadn't changed my, my um, website in maybe 10, 12 years or more. Um, it needs to be changed. Uh, <laughs> but um, I have so many referrals from other sources that it really hasn't been a priority. So how did you, or how do you market to these diverse communities that you've mentioned? Yeah. Um, it's actually much easier than, than yeah, you would think. So if you want to um, market to, for example, the Hispanic community, um, going to uh, the leaders, the local leaders in the Hispanic community, and reaching out to them. And um, I'm actually quite bold in that regard. I'll pick up the phone and say, I want to take you to lunch. I want to talk to you about what we do in my office. If you think there's somebody who could use a pro bono lawyer on this type of case, I'm happy to help. And really, we mean it. It's not just, it's, it's a two-way street for us. Um, also, going to the various events uh, that happen in that community. Uh, for example, the Arab Festival is coming right up. Uh, it would be great if um, dominant culture lawyers uh, went to the Arab Festival and met folks there and uh, really developed relationships. So how, how, would, how would someone who maybe has no ties or connections with any of these diverse communities get started? Where do they even begin figuring out where they are, who the leaders are, what events are, are happening? Marianne, I swear it's as simple as a Google search. <laughs> 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 Seriously, what you can find on the internet um, is really quite amazing. Just uh, to find out, you know, for example, the Turkish uh, community has a center in town. Who knew? <laughs> okay. So if you wanted to, um, I, I don't know of any Turkish attorneys. Um, I don't know that there are lawyers that are focused on uh, serving that community. Um, and I would say to a, a lawyer just starting out, uh, look up the Turkish center, find out who the leaders are, and go meet them and let them know you're there to help. Yeah. Also, I think that letting people know that you need their help to get your practice started makes all the difference to let you, folks know that you, you can help me. And this is what I would ask of you if you can do it. Um, and not be embarrassed about it. Sounds like excellent, excellent advice. So I don't know if you're prepared to answer this question, but I was wondering, is there anything on your nightstand right now, anything you're reading, or any books or movie, uh, movies, art, literature that have inspired you? So um, right now, on my nightstand, is a stack of depositions. <laughs> I'm getting ready to try uh, the TriMet bus crash case. And so uh, there's hardly uh, free time in, in terms of reading. Uh, you know, bedtime reading that uh, I would enjoy other than making sure 
I'm ready. Last night I spent uh, three hours uh, going over my direct exam of an economist. But seriously, I love my work so much, there's hardly a day that goes by that I don't thank my lucky stars to be doing the work that I do, uh, to uh, be able to serve the various communities that we serve. So I never mind that I have 16 depositions sitting on my nightstand. <laughs> so do you have anything else you'd like to add? You know, the one thing I want to tell um, uh, young lawyers or lawyers just getting out and starting a solo practice is to reach out to other attorneys. Um, the Oregon Trial Lawyers Association is one place where I felt like it's my uh, family away from home. Uh, there are hundreds of lawyers who will, uh, within a few minutes of me posting something on the OATLA listserv, that will provide me with forms, with answers, with help. Um, so I would uh, really encourage uh, young lawyers and lawyers just starting out to reach out, join organizations, go to meetings, uh, meet people, and ask for help. Thank you very much. Thank you.